uh, thank you, and I now recognize myself. Um, I, I appreciate very much Director Ray and General Flynn and Lieutenant General Pyatt taking the time to appear before the committee on this important topic. I appreciate your service and your testimony today. The insurrection on January 6th was not a random event. It was President Trump's last ditch effort to overturn the 2020 election and remain in power. President Trump picked the date weeks in advance. He riled up the rioters on the mall that morning and he pointed them towards the Capitol building and he said, fight like hell and quote, stop the steal, end quote. Today, the committee released documents showing that even as he was setting in motion the violent events of January 6, Donald Trump was putting direct pressure on the Department of Justice to overturn the election. His pressure was as relentless as it was disturbing. He asked the Attorney General of the United States to throw out millions of votes based on ludicrous conspiracy theories, but only in the states he lost. Unfortunately, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle we're silent today about these revelations, except to suggest that DOJ wasn't sufficiently loyal to President Trump during his pressure campaign. When Donald Trump failed to corrupt our nation's law enforcement, he resorted to organizing mob violence at the Capitol. This attack was planned in public, but today's hearing made clear that our nation's law enforcement, military, and intelligence agencies failed to do their jobs to protect our nation's capital. FBI Director Ray admitted today that he was unaware of the more than 50 tips from social media site Parler prior to the January 6th warning of violence, including one user posting that stated, quote, don't be surprised if we take the Capitol building, end quote. This was a massive intelligence failure by the FBI, plain and simple. The committee will continue to investigate this failure, and we expect Director Ray to honor the commitment he made today to expedite his agency's response to our requests, providing all the documents, and his commitment to conduct his own assessment of the FBI's failure and how we repent we, we, we prevent uh, this from happening in the future. We also learned today about serious failings at the Department of Defense. General Flynn admitted that the department made crucial errors in planning for January 6, but we still have not learned a single official except we haven't had or heard from anyone accepting responsibility for these catastrophic mistakes. Lieutenant General Pyatt also confirmed that it took nearly three hours for the National Guard to deploy after the Capitol Police, quote, frantically requested urgent and immediate support, end quote. In response, Lieutenant General Pyatt admitted today that he recommended that federal troops should not be used as, quote, a clearing force at the Capitol. So even after the Capitol was breached, the Defense Department resisted sending help. Clearly our committee has much left to investigate and that is exactly what we intend to do. Next month, Acting Chief Pittman will appear to answer tough questions about the role of the Capitol Police in the attack. In the meantime, our committee will continue to press for answers on the failures uncovered today, and we will bring in witnesses, including former White House Chief of Staff, to answer questions about President Trump's outrageous efforts to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election. In closing, I want to thank our panelists for their remarks, and I want to commend my colleagues for participating in this important conversation. With that and without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to sub 
submit extraneous materials and to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. This hearing is adjourned. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20 hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white military looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black on white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals, no matter what color they are? When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong. But that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. Yeah. You know, you look at January 6th. Everybody has said it was a tragic day. It never should have yep. happened. They wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson. He looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police but they don't talk about any of that. And you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house, trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focus on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, that, that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, the, where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. And I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that that January 6th is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for, to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage up, across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it 
via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. And I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people, right? And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy... Is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown. And I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that is, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day to day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure, it does in certain areas. But is the is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.